Thank you. Good morning. Happy Ada Lovelace Day. Um, I am going to start by explaining my slightly throaty uh, voice. I have been sick. Yesterday I had no voice, so I was extremely relieved this morning that I could make any noise at all. So apologies in advance if I need to stop and cough. It won't be good. Okay. How do your colleagues contribute to test automation? Who is involved in the design, development, and maintenance of your test suites, and who isn't? What would happen if the people in your team changed the way that they participate in test automation efforts? And how could you influence this change? This presentation is going to challenge you to think about your answers to these questions. Very briefly, uh, my name is Katrina Clokey. I'm a test practice manager at the Bank of New Zealand. And on the slide are three things that I'm particularly proud of. Um, testing trapeze, which hopefully some of you have heard of and read. It's a bi-monthly software testing magazine that we release from the bottom of the world. We have two Kiwi, two Australian, and one international contributor in each edition. Um, the WeTest conferences, so we started a meetup about five years ago down in New Zealand. Um, just last month we had our two conferences for the year. We reached just over 400 testers in New Zealand. It's pretty exciting. Um, and at the start of August I released a book. Um, it's available on LeanPub. Lots of people seem to like it. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about testing in DevOps, I'd encourage you to go and take a look. When I was 13 years old, I played hockey. Field hockey, not ice hockey. This is a photo of my first hockey team, and I'm in the middle of the back row with the awesome curly fringe. I have a lot of fond memories of playing in this team. And when I think about the experiences I had, I feel really happy, that sense of belonging to something. When I was 10 years old, I really wanted to play hockey. And I have clear memories of asking my parents about it, probably because the conversation with them happened more than once. And I remember that feeling of how much I wanted it and how much I really wanted to play. So what happened in the three years from when I was a 10-year-old who really wanted to play hockey to a 13-year-old with fond memories of my high school hockey team? Three things. The first barrier to me playing hockey was that I had none of the gear. So both my parents are teachers, and I grew up in a small town in New Zealand, and for them, Buying hockey gear was a relatively large financial investment. And now, with retrospect as an adult, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty fair that they didn't want to immediately outlay a couple of hundred dollars for their 10-year-old. So to participate in the sport, I needed a stick, a mouth guard, shin guard, socks. And once I had finally convinced my parents that this was a good idea, I could get onto the field. It turned out that my enthusiasm for getting onto the field did not translate into a natural ability. And in fact, initially I was quite scared of participating in hockey games, which I think is reasonable, given that at the beginning I was standing on a grass field among a group of 10-year-olds, wildly swinging wooden sticks in the air. So I had to learn how to hit the ball and trap it, where to run, and then from the basics, I started to learn different positions on the field and set plays like short corners or sideline penalties. And learning these skills gave me the confidence to play the game, which meant that I started to enjoy it. In the New Zealand schooling system, I finished primary school at 10 years of age, and then I went to intermediate school for a couple of years, and then I started high school when I was 13. So each change of school resulted in a changing group of friends. So the third reason I ended up in a hockey team when I was 13 was because that's what my friends were doing. And we played games um, during the week after school in a nearby town. 
So we got to spend like 20 minutes in a minivan gossiping about what was going on at school. And as a teenager, that was an incredibly good motivation to play sport. Access skills and motivation. These are the three things that separated me at 10 years of age from me at 13 years of age. From a person who really wanted to participate in a sport to someone who felt like they were part of a team. I wanted to start with this story because I think this type of division is relatable. A lot of us have experience with team sport, either feeling that belonging as part of a team or the feeling of exclusion when you can't play for whatever reason. And access skills motivation are also the things that underpin the digital divide, which I want to talk just a little bit about now. So Germany has a population of around 81 million people. And according to recent statistics, around 8% of that population, or over 6 million people, do not have access to the internet. I come from New Zealand, which has a population of just over 4 million people. So that means there are more people in Germany without access to the internet than there are people who live in New Zealand. Um, so I was pretty sceptical when I read this. So what does it mean when a person doesn't have access to the internet? So the statistics were collected by the definition that an internet user is an individual who can access the internet via computer or a mobile device within the home where they live. So potentially some of these people might be able to get online when they go to work. Given that we're at Selenium Conf, I'm going to assume that there's no one in the room who falls into that group of six million people who don't have internet access in Germany. But I want you to take a moment to imagine what that must be like. That feeling of exclusion that you might have felt as a kid when you couldn't get into a sports team that you wanted to be part of, this has to be so much worse. And this statistic is access, not use. So there'll be people who have access to use the internet, but not the ability. They don't know about windows or browsers, bookmarks, social media. They've never created a resume in a Word document. And without this knowledge, having access is kind of meaningless, because you can't do anything with it. Just as I took to a hockey field and then stood there and realized I had no idea how to play, that unknown is quite scary. And then once you do know what's possible, what motivates you to keep coming back? So we got a computer for my grandmother, and she learned how to perform some basic tasks, but it was really hard to actually get her engaged with using a computer until she learned that she could receive photographs of her great-grandchildren via email. And then she had the motivation to be online. So just as I stayed in my hockey team as a teenager, because that's where my friends were, people are motivated to participate because of the interpersonal relationships that it enables. When I was asked to come and speak at this conference, I had been doing quite a bit of reading about an organization in New Zealand called the 2020 Trust, who are doing a lot of work in this space with a digital divide in my own country. And my brain works in kind of weird ways, and I was doing all this reading, and I thought, there's something in this about the way that we work in software development and the way that we create test automation frameworks. And the clearest um, explanation of that thought process that I've seen is a TED talk by OK Go. It's called How to Find a Wonderful Idea, and he describes the weirdness of my head so well. Uh, seeing those different visual things line up and you suddenly think, yes. So uh, the digital divide was the inspiration, but the majority of what I want to talk about is division in our development teams, and specifically around test automation. So I want to think about division more broadly to start off with. 
Um, this is a photo of my trip to the Grand Canyon, uh, and it's a total cliche of division, right? Like one cliff or the other. Um, but I actually think there are layers within this, and I wanted to show you what I mean with kind of a New Zealand twist. <laughs> so New Zealand is famous for having more sheep than people. Um, in the 1980s, it was one person to 20 sheep. Now this ratio has dropped, so it's only one person to six sheep. So on this slide is a picture of some sheep, and they're together, but they're divided. And this is kind of how I imagine the division in our software development teams. So I walk around the floor of my organization while teams are doing their stand-ups, and you can see everyone kind of in a semicircle around their visual management board. And they're standing together. They're close to each other. They're not like on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. But within that group, there are barriers. And there are different barriers depending on the lens that you apply when you're looking at them. And this talk came about because I think if you never think about this, if you never stop to consider the divisions that are rife within our daily life, then you might be missing out. Because you haven't thought about which pen you're in, which pen you've come from. You might be feeling left out and not able to explain why. Or you might be oblivious to someone in your team who's feeling left out. And I think considering these divisions helps us to feel empathy and also to more consciously split ourselves in a way that's right for our team. Let's talk about division and test automation. So given what I've talked about so far, you might think that it looks something like this. And we progress through those gates from left to right. I need access to source code. I need the skills to be able to write the code. I need to be enthusiastic about it. Boom. Except perhaps it's not quite that linear. Like, what if I'm a new tester in a team, and I have the coding skills, but I don't have the permission yet to contribute to the repository? Or what if I'm super enthusiastic, but I have no idea what I'm doing? It's not always one, then the other, then the other. And I'm not necessarily going to acquire each attribute in turn. So I think division and test automation looks more like this. It's a Venn diagram of division by access skills and motivation. And an individual could have any three of these, or any combination of the three, or all of them, or none. So to make sense of this, I want to talk in some real-life examples of teams that I've been part of. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to ask you to either draw on a piece of paper this, or take a photo of it on your phone, because the slides following get too complicated if I also give you this. This is a super weird feeling. I've never instructed people to do it. OK. So you hopefully have that in front of you, which is going to be useful. Someone told me I should try and add this in, but you'll see things are about to get a bit crazy. So I went to um, the $2 shop. I assume there's a European equivalent of this. And I purchased $20 worth of plastic farm animals and fencing in order to make the wonderful things that you're about to see. So the farmyard that I have been part of, the Venn diagrams that I'm about to show you, there are five main characters. This, this key is on the following slide, so you don't need to take a photo of this. I will give it to you. So goose, dog, horse, chicken, and deer. So the gray goose represents manager. In some of the teams I'm going to talk about, it was a project manager. In others, it was a software development manager. But in all cases, some kind of manager. The burgundy red characters are the business. 
So the dog is the product owner and the horse is the BA. Um, the orange chickens are the developers. I just liked coding. <laughs> and the yellow deer are the testers. So let's look at the division in test automation for team one. This is where you need like your photo. <clears throat> so this was an agile development team that I was part of in a large financial institution and I was one of two testers. We were the only two people in the team who were contributing to the test automation suite, so we're the two yellow deer um, right in the middle. The developers in this team could have helped us with our test automation, they had all the skills, but they didn't show any interest in helping us, and also we didn't give them access to our code. So they are the three orange chickens right at the top of the diagram, which is skills, but no access, no motivation. The BA didn't even know we had test automation, um, so they are over there on the outside. And in this team, we didn't have a product owner. But there was a manager, and in this team, it was a software development manager, and they were a really vocal advocate for test automation to exist, even though they had no idea like, what it actually was doing. They just read some articles and heard it was a good thing and were like, yeah, we're going to do that. So the test automation that this farmyard created was relatively low level. We were doing um, automation of retrieval queries for a transactional database. So there wasn't a whole lot of business logic because we were quite far down the stack. Um, and the business wasn't really involved in the design of our tests, and maybe that was OK. And the code in the suite was OK, but it probably wasn't as good as it could have been if we'd actually had the devs a bit more involved. The tests were stable, they ran. So team two was kind of a weird team for me, because you can see that as a tester, the yellow deer, um, I had the skills and motivation to contribute to test automation, but no access. So this was a gig I had as a consultant where I was brought in to help the existing team of developers and BAs um, learn how to test from a coaching capacity only, and then I was to leave again. So the devs and BAs had varying skills. Um, there were a couple of developers who were the main contributors to the suite. Um, the BAs had access and they were enthusiastic about it, but they had no skills. <laughs> like, they didn't know how to write or read code. And there were a couple of other devs who had both access and skills, but they firmly believed that test automation was not their job. And so they are the chickens over on the left um, with no motivation. So in this team, we built a massive backlog of technical debt in test automation because the developers who were the main contributors to this suite preferred to spend their time doing development. And the code in this test suite was super elegant, but the test coverage was really sparse. Team number three. In this team, everyone had access to the code except the project manager but it was skills and motivation that created the division in our team. So I ended up working on this test suite with one of the BAs, where the two animals in the very middle. He bought all the domain and business knowledge, helped to locate test data, made sure that we had a good test coverage, and I was doing the coding to implement what he wanted. In this team, I couldn't get any of the developers interested in automation. Half had the skills and half didn't, but none of them really wanted to dive in. And the product owner and the other BA had access to the code, but they weren't really that excited about it. And they would say, oh, we trust you. You guys have it covered. So they felt like they didn't need to be involved. And maybe that was OK. The automation here was good. I think it could have been slightly better if we'd done a peer review process um, in the middle that was discipline. So I would, as a tester, have a tester review my work rather than just that BA tester peer. And then team number four, I wanted to talk briefly about a team where we had no test automation, because I imagine that some of you in the audience 
are in a situation like this. So this was a small team. Um, I was working with two devs. And we had a BA and a product owner, but no other manager alongside us. And the technical side of the team all had access to the code base and the skills to write test automation, but we didn't really have any time. And there was no motivation for us to do it. So one of the things that putting together these little farmyards made me realize is that I've been really fortunate to have that grey goose down in the corner cheering it on. Um, because a manager who throws their weight behind this work can create the motivation to pull the technical people into the middle. So in this team, we had some unit tests, but there wasn't anything beyond that. And we did a lot of repetitive testing that, in retrospect, was kind of silly. So I hope that you've heard some similarities to your situation and my experiences. And what I'd like to do here is pause and ask you to consider your current team and where you would put your colleagues in the test automation farmyard. So this may be slightly easier to see. I'm just going to have a glass of water. You can note it down. You can just think in your head. Um, but it will be useful for you to have this in front of you in some form when I keep going, because I'm about to flip it again. Okay, I have no idea if that was long enough, but it is now. <clears throat> so we've talked a bit about this model, and I want to start thinking about how the people um, in this, kind of how you would label them, how you would label their contributions depending on which pen they were standing in. So access, skills, motivation, is hopefully either drummed into your head or on a phone in front of you. So these labels are going to change. Teacher, observer, advocate. So if I'm a person who only has the skills, maybe teacher is the right label. I'm kind of unsure on this one. Um, they have the knowledge, but maybe they're not like super proactive in going and active, like giving it out to you. And also, they might not necessarily have the access to the code. If I only have access, then I'm an observer, and probably a passive observer, because I'm not motivated to be more involved. And if I'm only motivation, then I'm kind of an advocate, that positive force. And it might not always be helpful, but at least it's that source of energy. Where the boundaries overlap, problem solver, coach, inventor. So a problem solver is someone with access and skills, but maybe they don't get involved in automation day to day. They're great for helping you to debug specific issues or asking specific questions about test coverage. They're kind of like your go-to person. Maybe someone who helps review pull requests every now and then, too. Coaches have the skills and motivation, but no access. So they're kind of that outside influence that offers a positive and hopefully useful guidance. Um, they're the people who I'd go to when I don't want them to do the answer for me, but I kind of want to talk through what the answer might be. Potentially a coach is a tester from another team. And then inventors are those who have access and motivation, but no skill. And I really liked the slide from Simon's talk yesterday morning. 
He had Alice in Wonderland, the flamingo and the hedgehog. And I thought, yeah, they're an inventor. Like, <laughs> they can see it. They can see the code. They are motivated to get, participate. They're like super excited. Um, but they don't really have the skills. And so they'll throw out ideas. And some of them are awesome, and some of them are super crazy, and no. Um, but these people can be a really good source of innovation. And then in the middle are the committers. So these are generally the people who are going to keep the suite going. They've got access, skills, and motivation. Initially, I called that middle thing contributor. And then I thought about it a bit more, and I feel like actually the whole team is contributing to your test automation effort in some form. So in front of you or in your head, you kind of had that picture of your team in skills, access, motivation. And now you have some labels for the way that they might be contributing to the suite. And now what I'm going to ask you to do is consider whether your colleagues are in the right place. And I want to be clear here that I'm not advocating for everyone to be in the middle. Because unlike the digital divide, there's not necessarily a goal state here. In the stories I've shared, I think there's a lot of value in having people in all of those different roles to create the forces that you need to pull people around the model. But in your team, potentially, there might be specific people you can shift within this model that would create a really big impact for your team and your test automation. So I'm going to revisit the four teams I talked about earlier to illustrate this. So team one, you remember that all the developers were teachers. They had the skills, but nothing else. Um, in retrospect, if I was choosing one thing to change here, I w we should have given at least one of the developers access to our code. And then they could have stepped into that problem-solving role and provided more hands-on help and potentially got involved in code review. And then that might have been like a gateway to get them more motivated to actually step into that committer position. In team two, I found it really frustrating to coach the team without being able to directly influence the code. So this was the team that was creating that huge backlog of technical debt in their test automation. If I could change one thing here, I would have fought harder for access to the code base for myself. And I think that with that position, I could have had some impact on the prioritization of test work and the test coverage that we were providing through that suite. In team three, it would have been really good to have a peer review from the same discipline. So bringing in a developer to look at the implementation of the tests and another BA to look at the business coverage could have made this suite a whole lot more robust. And in team four, we needed an advocate. Because without that manager, that grey goose in the corner, there wasn't the motivation for people to actually do test automation. So without a manager, I think the product owner is probably the logical choice for this. And yeah, could have created the change we needed to actually get the technical people to do this work. So if you look at the team that you've either drawn in front of you or thought about, which person would you move in this model and why? What impact do you think it would have on the test automation that your team is creating? I wanted to just diverge slightly. So yesterday morning, um, Simon's keynote, he talked about there being seven people who've had over 1,000 commits to the Selenium code base. And what I found really interesting about that as I was thinking about this and wondering for the Selenium community where you would put everyone else. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, the code's open source, so in theory, everyone has access if they go pull it, right? 
Um, I think there must be a lot of observers, because we're all kind of using it, but we're not doing anything with it. I feel like the flamingo people, there's a few of those, where they're super keen, but they don't really know what they're doing. Um, and I wonder if maybe there's an absence of problem solvers and the people who have the skills, but they're the gateway for you to get into that commit. It's just a thought. OK, so you want to move someone around. Wow, that's super low resolution. Um, so this is Conway's law. In the 1960s, Mel Conway talked about organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations, which basically means who you talk to will influence what the thing you make looks like. And so all my like plastic fencing and farm animals is basically this. The test automation that you create as a team, the coverage it provides, the stability of your code, the elegance of your code, its ability to fulfill a business need. These things are all directly influenced by who is contributing to that suite and in what capacity. And for me, I get kind of racked up when people talk about culture being a separate thing to the tooling. Like, we're going to learn about the tools and go code stuff. But the culture and the communication parts that you establish in your team, that's what makes this. Like, you have to be thinking about both sides. You can't just go and code in the corner. It's not going to work. So say you want to change things. To influence, you need to step back and think about what you're trying to change. So say you have a model in front of you, and you're trying to move someone from observer to problem solver. Like, how do you do that? First, you need to think about what you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, you kind of end up standing in one place, waving your arms around ineffectually. So I want to back out a bit and think about what skills, access, and motivation, what those involve because those three attributes aren't binary in themselves. And if you're trying to influence one of those dimensions, then I think you need to understand what you're specifically targeting and why. So this is like uh, the onion and Shrek, layers and layers, parfait. So access might mean access to code, but is that read-only? Can I edit? Can I create new stuff? Does access include having licenses to tools, permission to install and set up a development environment locally? Perhaps access means being able to see a report of test results in a continuous integration server like Jenkins. Like that level of access might be enough for like a business analyst or a product owner to understand the scope of automated test coverage and to give you some feedback about it. So with access, you're thinking about what are your observers able to see? What types of problems can your problem solvers react to with the access that they have? And how does the level of access limit the ideas of your inventors? Skill is not just coding skill. There's a guy called Ash Winter, who's from Ilkley, West Yorkshire in England. And he's um, created this wheel of testing, which I think is a useful prompt for thinking more broadly about skill. So coding or scripting is one skill that will help you contribute to test automation, but so are test analysis, knowledge of the systems under test, the ability to retrieve different types of test data, creating an, a strategy for your test automation, or even just creating readable test reports that people can understand. So with skills, how do the skills of your teachers, your coaches, and your problem solvers differ? Where do you have expertise, and where is it lacking? And then motivation is not just, I want test automation, 
or I don't? Like, how much are people prepared to invest here? So you might have a manager who kind of toots the horn of 100% automated test coverage. Motivation might mean that I'm compelled to do something, but not necessarily all that I should. So with motivation, you're thinking about how invested are your advocates? Should they be pushing for more, or should they kind of be backing off a bit? And how engaged are your coaches and your inventors? Like, how often are they participating? How motivated are they to be contributing? And then the last thing I want you to consider here is who isn't inside your fence. So we've talked about geese, dogs, horses, chickens, deer. But I miss the cows. So consider who's not in the picture. Are there any other animals around your organization who should be part of your test automation farmyard? So operations. Maybe they're an audience for your test automation so that they can understand the behavior of your system before it goes live. Your call center or support staff, if you're um, creating executable specifications or any form of living documentation, how useful would that be as a manual for some of these people who are working in support roles? And then what information can you get back from those people by sharing some of that stuff? So at this point, I was imagining that I would have an audience of slightly hungover and startled deer. So I'm going to just quickly recap what I've talked about and then finish off with kind of a call to action. So I started this talk by sharing with you my amazing feats as a hockey player at the age of 13. And the reason I did that is I want you to think about the feelings of both belonging and exclusion. Because what underpins this whole model is that there's division all around us, and if we fail to consider it, we can't actively make decisions about where people are or feel empathy for people who might be feeling either excluded or like, woo, I'm cool. Um, I talked very briefly about the digital divide, mostly because it was the inspiration for this talk. And if you take nothing else away, um, I think it's amazing that there's more people in Germany with no internet than people in New Zealand. Um, I talked about that Venn diagram of access, skills, and motivation. And then we labeled that and started talking about teachers and observers and advocates and so on. And then we talked about how teams might look in that model and how you might challenge yourself to change where people are. And then finally, I've talked about the layers within the layers and how access, skills, and motivation themselves aren't binary. So at this point, I want you to go and do something. If you've thought about it and you feel like someone needs to be somewhere else, and the response that I get often to this from people in the teams that I work with is, is that really my role? Like, I'm not a superhero in my organization. I am just a tester, or just an automation engineer, or just a whatever your job title is. This is above my pay grade. And to you, I say, Anyone can put on a superhero costume. Anyone. I tried really hard to find a deer in a superhero outfit, but the internet did not provide. So I think as testers, we already use the weapons of change daily. They're called questions. So ask, what is driving the current situation? What's wrong with it? Are there problems? And if there aren't any problems, is there an opportunity? And what? 
and then think about how you can do something about it. So it might be enough to just raise awareness of who doesn't have access to something that they should have access to. Or maybe you want to have some conversations with people in your team to find out what their appetite is to move to another part of the model. You might be able to support people who are asking for training courses, for example, so that they can up their skills. And you always have the opportunity to just lead by example and embrace a growth mindset in yourself in the hopes that what you're doing will influence others. So how do your colleagues contribute to test automation? Who is involved in the design, development, and maintenance of your test suites? And who is not? What would happen if people in your team change the way that they participate in test automation efforts? And how could you influence this change? I hope that you'll leave this talk thinking about your answers for those four questions. Thank you. So I had the OK to, oh, can you put my slide back, please, Mr. Mann? I had the OK to not um, take questions. <laughs> However, I'm going to stand down there for the half hour after this. If you wanted to come talk to me, do. Otherwise, you can contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn or on my blog. Thanks. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was so lovely.